I, I know that everyone tells you that you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but I got to tell you, just the other day, uh, th this, this happened, I did that very thing. Uh, I judged a book solely by its cover. Uh, there was a book, uh, it's called The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer, uh, and any Tozer fans in here? Probably one, one, one or two in the back. They're great. Uh, and, you know, someone had said in, in a conference that I was watching, oh, this is an amazing book. Uh, the, the guy said that he had read it, like, for like, 20 years over and over and over. I said, man, I, somebody reads a book over and over, I got to read it at least once. So I go on to Amazon, and, and I look, and it's not as easy. It used to be in the, in the old days. You go to the bookstore, and there was one copy of it sitting there, and it was the same book. Uh, and so, but when I went on to Amazon, there were a bunch of different editions of this, same exact book, same exact text, same chapter headings and everything else, but the covers were all different. Some of them had, if, if you've been on Amazon, you know, some of them have that really just dull 70s, the rock in that 70s look. It's like purple fading into like magenta, and it has like some really awful fonts, uh, you know. Some, some guy who, who didn't even, like, can't even really see was, was doing the, the, the layout work for it. Uh, and, and I'm like, I, I want one that looks cool. So this is the one I bought. It's right here. See? And, and to me, I mean, I, I could, they were all the same price. But it was just weird that I had to go with the one that, that had the, the coolest cover for some reason. I, I don't know. It's not going to help me read it any better. But that's the way it works. We do it all the time. See, and I had the benefit of somebody steering me toward that book and recommending it. I don't know how many books I have not read because I go by and the cover doesn't look like it's something that I would even be interested in. I just kind of dismiss it out of hand. How, how many times have you not, not seen a movie because somebody said it was terrible? Oh man, you know, and, and you might really like it. But someone else's subjective opinion, you look at that and they said, oh, this is the worst movie ever made, and so you're not going to go. So unless it's Cabin Boy, which was a movie from way back in the 80s, don't watch that one, please. Uh, that, that is, you can judge that one all day long. It's a terrible movie. Uh, but, but there's a lot of great movies out there that, that you probably miss. Uh, and, 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 and probably the worst case of this or worst instance of this is when we dismiss people because of how someone else has talked about them. Has this ever happened to you? I, I want you to meet, and, and uh, somebody gave me a great name uh, in, in the second service, because uh, I, I don't want to pick someone's name, because you might think I'm talking about you. So there's no Claude's today, are there? Right? And if Claude, if you're watching online, sorry. This isn't about you. Uh, but let's say someone says, hey, I want you to meet my friend Claude. Uh, and then, but what they do is they tell you all kinds of negative things about Claude. Now, Claude, it's nasty. Claude's probably going to judge everything you say. Claude is, is ornery, and, and he's just irritable. So uh, what are you going to think about Claude, even though you've never met him? I mean, you're ready for a fight, aren't you? You're ready to defend yourself, and, and, you've got, and Claude might be like the nicest guy in the world, but the guy who's describing it to him just had a really bad experience and, and actually probably hurt Claude, and has, Claude has every good reason to, to be angry with him. But they brought you into all that mess, and, and it clouded your way uh, of seeing it. So you're judging that person on their reputation, and you haven't even met them. I find it so much better when I haven't heard about a movie, or I haven't heard about how someone is, and I can make up my own mind about them without any kind of preconceived, no, without any baggage. See, because I think so many times, I mean, we miss out. We miss out on, 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 on people on, online that we could le learn from because, oh, it, it looks boring or the person, you know, looks a certain way or, or maybe the way they set up their website is really horrible. And we judge the book by its cover. If we sat and listened, we might get a whole lot out of it. We might grow and God might use that to really help us. But again, we won't even give it the time of day. We do it with churches. We do it with, right, because we have our preferences. We have our style things. And I don't want to say this morning, it's okay to have your own style, but just realize that what, what Paul wants us to do this morning is to try to somehow, right, through God's power, to see past some of the external stuff, because I think if we don't, we will miss out on what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of other people. We're going to miss out on opportunities to reach folks. We're going to miss, miss out on a lot of stuff because we're stuck 
judging and worrying about what we think is important. So today what we're going to do in this We Refuse series is we're going to refuse to play it safe. We're going to refuse to sort of judge and, and to buy into all that. Last week we talked about at the beginning of this uh, series, which is uh, we're going through 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. Uh, we began at the beginning of, of 1 Corinthians 4 and we said, look, we are not going to lose heart. We refuse to lose heart. And so let's turn to that. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. You got, there's some Bibles there in front of you. Grab one of those. Uh, you'll need it because we're, we're backing up a little bit. And, uh, you know, you, I mean, you could follow in your bulletin, but you're going to be a little, uh, you're going to miss the first section of this. Uh, so I'll give you guys a second to turn. Uh, so he, he starts out this whole thing. And the reason why we kind of named this series this is because Paul is talking very, he's, 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 he's kind of putting his foot down. He said, we don't, we don't lose heart. This is what we, we don't do. Why? Because this is God's ministry that he has given to us. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than, than our, our synod. It's bigger than, than our denominations. It's bigger than all of this. This comes from God himself. It's because of his mercy. Notice he says that at the beginning. I didn't really talk about that that much last week. But, but God is even merciful for, to us. He knows that the, the kind of right, backstories that we have. He, he knows the kind of issues that we have. Paul certainly had a crazy backstory. But it's because of God's mercy. He has said, look, I have put you in this place, Christ Memorial Luther Church, right here, right now, Malvern, to tell the world about him, to embrace him in all that he's done, his forgiveness, his love in Jesus Christ. And it's because of all of that that we don't lose heart. Even though everything around us might seem to, to be against us. And I don't know about you, but I read over and over again in, in, online about, about the church, and there's this scandal here, and there's this issue there, and it's all in there, and, and it might cause us to go, well, gee, well, maybe this is, maybe it's time to fold. I don't, I don't think it is at all. I think it's time to say, look, this, this is not about us. This is about what God is doing through us. In verse 6, we're going to skip down there because we're, we're going to do 7 to 12 uh, today. But, but I want to include 6 because it's so huge. He says, for God, who back in, back in the beginning of creation, there was nothing, right? There was darkness. There was, there was not even darkness. There was nothing. And God said, let light shine. Let there be light. So that same God who, who, who did that made his light shine in our hearts, my dark heart that has nothing to offer God, that is, that, that without Jesus, I am like separated, I got no hope. He, he came and shined a light into that heart. The gospel, the truth that Jesus died for me, brings light from that darkness. He has done that. And that's nothing short of me seeing and having the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ as I see him dying on that cross for me, as I see his, him, him alive and, and triumphing over death and the grave. Now, I, I'm able to see, we're, all, we're able to catch a glimpse of the, of the glory of God that goes into our messed up hearts. Our dark and, and, and hearts that were enemies of his. He came in, shined his light, saved us has given this to us. It's why we refuse to settle for anything less than what he has for us. Anything less than the future he has dialed in for us as a church and as people. Now, again, through all this, Paul is still trying to, to deal with the, the detractors, right? He's trying to deal with the critics. He's got them, even within the church, that, that are looking at his story. Uh, and could you imagine... Uh, Paul's bio, if, if he were to come and like, be the pastor of your church, like, oh, let's take a look at, oh, we got Saul of Tarsus, all right? Looks like a good guy. You have his picture there, and then you read his bio, and you're like, oh, my. So your last job was um, rounding up Christians and destroying them, having them arrested, having them thrown into jail, having them killed. You know, I, I would, we would have some problems with that probably. It, it would be difficult and I really believe, I said this last week, that, 
that that is nothing short of a miracle and, and proof of God's working. Not just that Paul was converted, but I think the hearts of the people that were going to have to accept him, and they did, had to be converted as well. Their, their minds and hearts had to be changed that, yeah, he's legitimate now. He is no longer doing that, that God has changed him, and now he is working to bring the gospel and not take it away and not shut it down. That's why I think he says in verse 7 that we have this treasure, this glory of God, this, this, um, this, this, this truth that we're saved. It's in jars of clay. And that is to show that this all-surpassing power comes from God and not from us. So what Paul is saying is, could we stop rehearsing my backstory for a minute? He's like, I don't, I don't care. It's, it's, I'm an open book. I did all that. He says, in various, you, you can open up to almost anything Paul's written, and you'll see him say, I'm chief of sinners. He's not trying to sugarcoat it at all. He's saying, without Jesus, I got nothing. I deserve nothing. But that is not me anymore. I'm saved. I'm free. I'm new. I'm born again, baptized into Christ, into his death, into his resurrection. That's who I am now. In Christ, that is not just who I am, it's what I am, it's what my life is today, yesterday, all, every day, boom, 24-7, all over that, all of the time, and it all comes from God. But if they're busy, listen to this, if they're busy nitpicking every little thing he does, they're going to miss out on this amazing thing that God not only did, but what God is doing through Paul and all the others. See, when we get nitpicky as church, when we get nitpicky on all these other things that really, in the, in the larger scheme of things, don't matter, right? How the church is decorated, what the architecture looks like, what, what the furnishings look like, how the pastor is dressed, right? What, what hymnal we use. What, we, we get caught up in all this stuff, and, and, and Paul is going, hey, hey, the power's from God, not, not, not your preacher, not your elders. It all comes from him, from him, from him, from him. Because while we're busy looking at, at what a, a man does or doesn't do, listen, and I'm not saying we shouldn't hold people accountable, we shouldn't encourage, we shouldn't train, we, shouldn't, we, should, we do all those things. But, but Paul's going, look, but realize that anything that anyone has, and I mean anyone in this place, anyone in, this, in, in the church throughout the world, it all comes from God. It's, it's his power. So Paul has a different mindset. The mindset is, is that he's not going to see the difficulties and the critiques and all that other stuff. The persecution, which, which he endured every day as, as a sign that he should give up, but rather as an opportunity to keep pressing forward. He says in verse 8, he says, we are hard pressed on every side. So in other words, it looks like we're surrounded. I mean, think of the visual there. It, it's not a pretty picture, right? It's not a church service where, you know, yeah, I'm going out, we're going to praise the Lord. This is him going out and preaching, and he's got, he's got people who are in the church who are going, oh, he, he's, he's all wrong. And you've got a crowd of, that has been incited by someone to, to bludgeon him to death on the other side. Okay? Do you want to sign up for that, anybody? Anybody saying, hey, could, I, could that be on my schedule for this week? Paul's going, that's my agenda. You open his, 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 uh, his iPhone and you look on his, on his schedule and it's like, I'm going to preach, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to heal up a little bit and I'm going to get back after it. That's his flow. That's his workflow. That's his daily thing. Hard pressed. But listen what he says. L listen. But he says, but I'm not crushed. We're not crushed. We're perplexed. We, we don't know sometimes what we should be doing. We, we get, in other words, we get, we get to where it's, it's beyond us to be able to figure this out. He's like, but you know what? But we're not in despair. Like, we don't give up. Like, we don't freak out. Why? Because God's got us. The surpassing power comes from Him. We, we are persecuted, attacked, ridiculed, all of that stuff. But you know what? But we know that God has not abandoned us. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. We, we, are, we actually wind up being struck down, but we're not 
destroyed. So what Paul says is, if I check my pulse and it's still going and I'm still on earth, I'm going to go and tell about Jesus. He said, I, I refuse to even let the worst of circumstances dictate what I'm going to do or not do. If I got breath, I'm going to go out and tell. If I got breath, I'm going to help somebody. If I got breath, I'm going to encourage somebody. And, and there's people all around us, don't, aren't there, that need our help. They need to know that, that God loves them. They need to, someone to listen to them. They need someone who's going to encourage them. See, but we can get so caught up in what the world's doing and, 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 and how they're, you know, maybe taking away some, some freedom or something like that. And we should fight for that. And we should fight for the truth. But we also got to be compassionate. And we also got to realize that sometimes that might be an opportunity for us to not just critique what's going on in our world around us, but to, but to shine the light of Christ. And to say, yeah, we do stand for something. We do stand for truth. And we're gonna and we're gonna listen and we're gonna talk and we're gonna communicate and we're gonna bring this truth. Listen to what he says in verse 10. He says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. I believe what he's saying there, it, it, this is like one of the hardest passages in here. I was like, whoa, what is he talking about here? Carrying around the body of Jesus, body of the death of Jesus. What he's saying is we so identify with his with, with that Jesus on the cross, which is a scandal which is a sign of weakness to the rest of the world because we see it as the greatest triumph and the greatest glory that we could ever experience and know the power of God. That marks who we are. It's so evident in everything that we do so that because we want that life of Jesus to be revealed in our body. And so if you're going to look at externals, look at how we preach Christ. Like if you want to look at how we behave, you want to look at all that conduct stuff, he says, Paul says, if you look at me, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to see the cross. You're going to see living, breathing proof that Jesus is the real deal, that he did conquer death and the grave. You're going to see it in everything that I do, everywhere that I go. It's all going to be there. For we, in verse 11, who are alive, we're always, listen to this, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So you want to see his real motives? I almost think like Paul's going, like, are you kidding me? Are, are you really questioning my motives? Well, I step into the pulpit every time, or I step in front of the angry mob, and I don't flinch. You can bring all the arguments, so we can have all the discussion. But he says, look, but that, I mean, what is that? We're willing to die. Many of them did. For Jesus' sake. Why? Listen to this. So that his life might be revealed in our mortal body. So in other words, we're willing to die because he did die for us. Let me say it one more time. I'm willing to die because he gave his life for me. Settle my debt with God 100%. I don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder whether I'm saved. I don't have to wonder what God thinks of me. So I put the whole new perspective. I, I refuse to say that, that that's not important. I, I refuse to think that anything else is important except for that. Verse 12, he says, so then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So bad deal for us, great deal for you. I think that's what he's saying, kind of. We've got it rough, but we're going to go through that, he's saying. And I think he's saying that for church. We're going to go through some uncomfortable things. We're going to go through some difficult things. We, we might even go through some persecution, but we're going to do it so that people around us who don't know him would know him. We'll undergo whatever it takes, even if it means death. And, and I just want to say that, that even though I think Paul's talking about physical death, and I don't want to, I don't want to ratchet that down at all, because that's exactly what he's talking about. But for him to get to that point, there had to be another, another death, and that was the death of, of, of Saul, the death of who he was, the death of what he wanted, the death of his agenda. 
the death of ours, the death of me thinking that life is about me and what I want, so that life could be at work in the people around me, in my family, in my kids. And again, we don't have to go anywhere to, to do this. It's right here. Like, we don't have to go to some war-torn part of the country where I'm dodging bullets and right, and again, there's bombs blowing up all over me. I mean, if, if that's your thing, then go. But, but for, for many of us, we're going to be right here, Chester County, PA, with, with people who don't agree, people who don't know. And, and, and it's, and it's going to feel very uncomfortable for us sometimes to go out, very uncomfortable for us to, to talk sometimes. But Paul's saying, you know what? Let, let's refuse to compromise. Let's refuse to say no. Let's refuse to, to, to look at, at life as any other way but then this big mission trip that we're on to go and tell people about Jesus and to go and, and to make disciples of all because of Jesus. So that we're all following him, knowing that he loves us, knowing that he, that he died for us. I think sometimes we're just we're too busy judging, judging the wrong things, looking at external things instead of looking at the heart, and we miss what God is doing. I want us to see what God is doing. I want us to be a part of what God is doing every day. And so we look to the cross, right? We look to what he has done. We embrace that love that he's given. We embrace that, and we, and we, and we embrace that every day, and it's who we are. Every moment of every day, we are this, this living epistle, if you will. That's what Paul called the people that he, that he was ministering to. Your letter from God to the world, showing the world what it's about. So today we refuse to, to sell for anything other than that for us as church, for us as his people. And so let us pray. Heavenly Father, so much around us warring against what we do, against what we believe, what we think. Lord, help us in, in love to speak that truth, but help us to be quicker to, li to, to listen than we are to speak, to be slow to speak, slow to just jump to conclusions, to judge things that maybe we know little about. So help us to listen especially to you as, you, as you remind us of your love, as you remind us of your truth, that we are loved and forgiven, that we are free, but that we might be encouraged and filled with that truth today and every day. And so bring that truth to the people around us so that they might know that you hold them in your hands. Lord, we, we just ask for your strength Help us to remember that that strength comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.